Hello and welcome to Getaway Day. This is episode 101. That's a mouthful. My name is Gautam. His name is Mason. And today we're going to talk about our first uh, almost full week of baseball of the 2023 season. How's it going, Mason? Not too bad. Been uh, was in St. Louis all weekend. Watched a couple of games there. Um, went to opening day. Fantastic. Uh, what I will say um, b- before we get into the conversation is that some of the differences I'm seeing already, both in like the Cardinals team individually and the league overall, is as black and white as Cruella Deville's hair from last year. Like it's it, it's pretty. What? Pretty okay, stark. you know. Okay, if you if you just drop that there, like we have to we have to go to that now. So, oh. but um, yeah, so you went to opening day in St. Louis against the Blue Jays. Uh, yeah. Give us a little taste of uh, what that experience was like, and uh, go. So this has now been my second opening day that I have been to. So I went with my cousin Derek. Um, if you guys watch the uh, the Twitch chat here, um, he's. I th- cards baseball seven or something i think is what it is um but yeah so we've started doing this is an every every year thing and that's kind of our plan going forward last year um was albert pujols and yadier molina's final opening day um their last opening day with wayno as a group and so they did a big thing with that that was really cool this year was entirely different because yes it's wayno's last opening day and they did make a deal at, about that. Like they let Wayno sing the national anthem, which was actually really good. I was impressed. Um, but this year felt like it was more about the young core that's coming up. And so from last year to this year, it's like this is the end of an era. We don't really truly know what's coming next. To here's what's next. And what's next is Jordan Walker made his opening day debut. Um, for his major league debut, got two base hits, I think. Um, At least one. I, I think he had two. I think he had an infield hit, and I think he had a a, a legitimate, like, put it into the outfield base single. Um, And that was really, really cool to see, getting to see Gorman back in the lineup there, along with Newt, and just some of the some of the changes to the lineup this year. It it was really, really fun to watch. And then throughout the weekend, you then see like Gorman go off, hit two home runs in a game on Sunday. You see Alec Burleson hit a home run in, in the game on on uh, Saturday. And you just you see this youth and it's an entirely different energy. And that is kind of how I feel about the league as a whole right now. Yes. One hit. One, One for hit five for Walker. Yeah. He uh, did he have two on Saturday? I don't know. He might have. I I, I just went him. ahead and navigated myself to the box score of opening day because that was quite the game, and I'm sure we, you have some thoughts on what actually unfolded during during that game. Yeah. So, like I said, uh, everything feels different this year, and the biggest thing that I noticed, especially in that game, like if you go look at the box score, you'll see what I mean. There were a lot a lot of base hits as the guy that was sitting directly behind me pointed out every single time there was another hit. There's 30 hits. There's 30 hits in this game. He did that for 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Like we get the point, dude, we can count. Um, but that's a lot of hits. Like he, he wasn't wrong to be surprised by that. It was just annoying that he did it every time. Um, but yeah, like we were seeing balls that would have been eaten up by the shift last year. Like Brendan Donovan, I think, had a, a single between the first baseman and second baseman. Tommy Edmond had a single right there. We were seeing little bloop singles into shallow center that I don't think would have gotten there. I think the Blue Jays in that game alone had 10 hits that were on batted balls under 75 mile an hour, which is incredibly wild. Um, They had 13 balls hit like that. 10 of them landed for hits. That is not a thing that's going to hold true for the course of the season. But it definitely showed you that the way that they have started limiting the shift, not not getting rid of it entirely, but limiting it, did make a big difference as far as balls landing in play. So Yeah, totally agree. Saw that all weekend long with lots of balls. 
uh, reaching the outfield in places that in the last five plus five, 10 years would have been eaten up by the shift. Um, for me, it's just a little bit of a getting used to period because, you know, I see the, the batted ball and I, I expect it to get swallowed up and it's not. So I'll have to remember what baseball was when I wasn't such a big fan, I guess. Yeah. It's really cool for me to see because it's like, I I do. I've been really blessed being a Cardinal fan and I don't think anyone's going to argue that like we've had fantastic defenders. Um, Just thinking back even to the MV3, when Albert was the best defensive first baseman at the time, Scott Rowland, who just got uh, elected into the Hall of Fame, uh, and Jim Edmonds in center, all those guys had like incredible range for their positions. And so, like, I'm I get to see that again, but uh, obviously it's different people, and people aren't used to having to have that range anymore. So it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting getting back to where people have that agility and that range to get to some of these balls so yeah totally um i guess any other thoughts from that opening game before we go on to some other games yes uh one very specific thought so i don't usually get the like unique foods that they make every year at the different stadiums but I think this might be the year that I start trying them because on opening day, we're sitting there and we were starting to get a little peckish because it was the end of like a freaking four and a half hour game or something stupid. Um, Just with as many hits, it it was a long game. Um, And the Cardinals had this chicken sandwich uh, from Shaq's Hot Chicken. It's a Nashville hot chicken on a red donut that has a maple bacon glaze. And then it has a chipotle mayo on it or uh, sauce on it it was awesome who can say no to that that sounds amazing exactly it, it, yeah. it's like the first time that i've gone to a game at bush stadium and not just gotten nachos like it was good yeah so i think this is going to be the year that as we go to different stadiums i'm trying the unique foods yeah when we go uh to wrigley field next month uh i think they've got a whole bunch of new food options so we'll have to try some new food is is that on our uh, single day doubleheader? Yep. Oh yeah, we're gonna be doing a lot of stuff with that. I think because that's gonna be fun. We're going to a White Sox and Cubs game in the same day. Gonna be awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah. So while you were watching opening day in St. Louis, other opening days were going on all around Major League Baseball. I just had some other thoughts that I I figured I just wrote them down so I'd remember them for this podcast. And what better way to start the 2023 season than for Aaron Judge to hit a home run, the first home run of the season uh, off Logan Webb in the first inning, which was a bomb to dead center. So, I mean, guy picked up right where he left off. So, question. Did he hit one in 2022 on opening day? Because if not, I vote that we change it so that he had 63 home runs because technically it would still only be 162 games that he did it in. (laughs) That's true. I do not know if he hit a home run on opening day 22. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, another kind of cool home run feat that I totally just remembered um, now. Uh, there is a player who has now hit home runs on four consecutive opening days. Can you tell me who that player is? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, four consecutive opening days. Mm-hmm. He's the third one ever on his team to do it. He's the only active player left on the team that's done it. And I got to watch it. Uh, well, I'm looking at the box source. I'll cheat a little bit here. And say that it was George Springer. It was not no, no, George he didn't Springer. Have a home run. Who was it? Tyler O'Neill. Oh, that's I never would have guessed that. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting stat, too. Uh, Derek and I did uh, place a couple bets for opening day. We uh, picked him to hit his home run, so paid out eight bucks. It was great. <laughs> nice. But. Um, yeah, and then uh, another really cool matchup that happened was Hunter Green versus O'Neill Cruz. This is what we've been waiting for all offseason when we didn't have baseball, power versus power. This is a matchup like 
this is why we watch these games, you know, Hunter Green just pumping 100 mile per hour fastballs um, on this specific pitch to O'Neill Cruz was 102 miles per hour. And O'Neill Cruz took it out of the ballpark um, and hit the ball at 111 miles per hour. I mean, that's just so amazing to me on both sides of, of, of the thing. So I will say anyone who can turn on a 102 fastball is going to probably hit it over 100 pretty easily. Because, like, you're not going to lose velocity turning it around. That's true. That's um, true. So the fact that he didn't hit it 120 surprises me. I think that's mostly Hunter Green's doing. I don't think that that has anything to do with O'Neill Cruz's power. Until you remember that O'Neill Cruz has hit a ball 120. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. not saying that he can't do it. I'm just saying <laughs> that in this particular batted ball instance, I think all that velo came from Hunter Green. Yeah. Um, and then Adley Rutschman went five for five in his first opening day with the Orioles. And that was incredible. Hit a home run. Uh, he also had a walk in the game. So on base six times. First, we're going to talk a little bit. First catcher to be on base six times on opening day since 1901. Wow. Who was that catcher? Uh, I don't remember. Let me. Um, I think that was uh, Sarah Langs that tweeted that. So give me just one minute and I'll find it. But yeah, awesome star for for Rutschman. He seems like he's going to be in MVP conversations, if not this year, in the in the very near future. Like this guy looks like a absolute superstar on both sides of uh, of the game. Um, very excited for for how the Orioles kind of use him. And Grayson Rodriguez has been promoted, making his first start tomorrow. So that's kind of the future of Orioles baseball right there. Yeah, it's going to be uh going to be fun to see him, Gunner, Adley and Ryan Mountcastle all on the field together. I think that's that's a core that I think a lot of people have been looking forward to for a long time. So it, it's going to be it's going to be fun, I think for Orioles fans here this year. Yep. I think it it's giving me pretty heavy like 2021 Mariners vibes. Yeah, I could see that. We just got to see some pitching here. So Grayson might be the first step in that. Yeah. Hopefully he's the first step, because if he's the last step, yikes. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the stat I was looking for? <laughs> the first catcher to go get on base six times since oh. 1901. Yeah, so I need to be down in. I I'm still in April. Sarah has tweeted a lot so far this month. Baseball is the best. Yes, it is. Okay, so um, I thought we'd take a little bit of time here to look into some stats leaders here. I think they could lead to some uh, interesting conversations. Obviously, it's way, way, way too early to be making any definitive judgments about anything, but we might just do that here. I will be making uh, definitive statements about everything. Yeah, the uh, the Twins are not going to lose a game this season. Nope, neither are the Rays. It's going to be really awkward when they play each other. It is. So let's just take a look at these stats leaders and, and see what we can say at this point about them. Um, so the first one's home runs. And the, the actual home run leader now is Brian Reynolds, who hit his fourth home run today, but... I want to talk about Joey Gallo, who has three home runs. He was the leader coming into today. Joey Gallo is getting a fresh start with the Twins. He signed a one-year deal, uh, playing some outfield for them. He had a terrible season last year between the Yankees and the Dodgers. But Joey Gallo has been a premium power source for years. So it's really not that surprising that he has three home runs. But do you think Joey Gallo can? can keep it up this season and actually get back to his old ways. Sorry. I finally found the tweet I was looking for. What was the question? The question is about Joey Gallo. Oh, can he get back to his old ways? I don't know. I, yes, I think the answer is yes for a couple very specific reasons. One, his entire game has always been pure power. 
Like there has not been a batting average, like a high batting average component to Joey Gallo's play in the past. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that power come back and him still have a pretty low batting average. I think some of the changes, especially limiting the shift, he kind of got hit by the shift pretty hard. Um, so I would expect to see some more balls get through and his average not be sub 200. Like I think it probably could have been here the last couple of years and wouldn't have shocked me. Um, so yeah, I think with some of the changes we've seen and some of the ways that the game is already starting to kind of adapt to the new rules, I can see Joey Gallo having a pretty solid season and getting back to a 25, 30 home run guy with a 230 batting average. So. 230 batting average, that's the part that I, if he does that, then you're talking about a 40 home run season, which is not so crazy for Joey Gallo. He's done it one, two, he's, he's had a 41 home run season, a 40 home run season, a 38 home run season. His best batting average was 253. Every other year <laughs> has been two or 209 or below. So batting average, not, not a strong suit. Um, OBP, that's a different story. Guy still gets on base, walks a lot, and the power is insane still. Real quick, um, I found the answer on okay. So, 1901 was just when they started tracking, so technically, he was he was the first one to do it, um, in tracked statistics. However, he is the fifth catcher since 1901 to reach base safely five times. Uh, with Jason Veritek, Todd Hundley, Yogi Berra, and Ray Shock. Cool. So wait, so who is the guy that did it six times? No one. Adley was the first. Oh, oh, he was the first. Okay. Yeah, because 1901 was just when stats like for stuff like that started being readily available. Got it. So it's as far back as we can track it. Well, thanks for finding that answer. I guess you're welcome. Um, yeah. And then just side, quick side note on Brian Reynolds, like is Brian Reynolds trying to play himself out of Pittsburgh? Cause he's been in negotiations for a contract extension with the pirates. Seems like they're hung up on, uh, whether he'll have a player option in that deal. Pirates don't want to give that up and he kind of wants one. So, yeah, and I mean, why shouldn't he want one? Yeah. Like, the especially with the contract that they're talking like they've only been talking like a it's very reasonable it's not even player friendly at all yeah i was gonna say they were talking about like a what a hundred million dollar contract max for like four years i think more than four years or five or something something. yeah yeah but like that is an incredibly team-friendly deal already and so he's taking a hit to stay with a team that's been bad for basically his entire career so far. He's been the guy. They have some pieces coming up, but they have not shown that they're going to go all in to actually win. Um, they're just kind of banking on getting lucky. If he sticks around, Cabrian pops off and O'Neill Cruz continues to be really good. And they just happen to like get Rich Hill to be a Cy Young somehow at the age of 45. So like if I were Brian Reynolds, I wouldn't settle for this without a player opt out either. I, I'm not sure that I would be terribly entertained with the negotiating with that team in general. Like, yes, it's a hundred million dollars. That's a lot of money, but he's a free agent at the end of the year. No, he's still got several years left. Like oh, does he? Years. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. That's never mind. Then you, it's a little bit more of a, how do you strong arm them into trading you? Yeah, they the pirates kind of have the the power there, but they also shouldn't they shouldn't lose Brian Reynolds over this. If if the opt out is the hang up on the deal, like it, they should get this done. But they're the pirates; and they have shown consistently that they do not get these kind of deals done. Yeah. Um. But we'll see. Yeah, so Bob Nutting's an idiot. So yeah, have we do, have we done a full like bash the Pirates episode yet, or have we only we done the Rockies to. and the Orioles? That might be coming soon in 2023. Let's write that down. All right. Notes. 
Ash the Pirates. Another guy kind of in the Joey Gallo mold, Joey Gallo light, you could call him, Adam Duvall, um, has joined the Red Sox, and he is off to some kind of ridiculous start. Like, he has two home runs. I'm trying to pull up his numbers here. Um, he had two home runs in the same game in a, in a ridiculous comeback victory for the Red Sox against uh, the Orioles. His season number is 588, 650, 1235 slugging percentage um, over his four games. And he leads the league in runs with seven to this point. And th- this is less about Adam Duvall and more about kind of what I saw out of the um, Red Sox lineup this opening week. They were unstoppable. It was in Fenway Park, so, you know, ballpark helps a little bit. But up and down the lineup, all their guys were just moving the line, getting on base, getting hits. Um, have we underestimated the Red Sox lineup? Maybe, but this is still a lineup that, on paper, is not thrilling. Like, yeah, I'm getting it pulled up again here. But, like, Duvall is a very solid player. Masataki Yoshida, he could be incredibly good. Um, Devers is really good. If Verdugo can be back to his old self, okay, yeah, I could I could see them having like a top four that are all really really solid. Um, I still don't know what we're gonna get out of Justin Turner. I still don't know that Christian Arroyo and Reese McGuire are even serviceable major league starters. Uh, bench guys, yeah, absolutely, sure. Starters, probably not. And then that leaves you with Tristan Casas, who is a rookie that hasn't had much time at the major league level. And then Kike, who, yeah, I think Kike is still a decent bat. He's not quite as good as he was three, four years ago with the Dodgers, but still a really good player. Um, So I don't know. Like, I still don't see them being this unstoppable force lineup. Like, I I feel like that might be just like a, a first series... Orioles pitching at Fenway fluke. Like yeah. I, could, I think they could still. I think they could be solid. I don't think they're a good lineup. That's fair. Yeah, I think they're. I I would say they're they're not bad. They're they're above average. They're maybe not like what they showed. They're obviously not what they showed this weekend. But um, the guy like Duvall, I think he's perfect for Fenway Park. Uh, I mean, Adam Duvall hit 38 home runs just two years ago for the Braves and the Marlins. So um, with the short left field with the monster, I mean, who is to stop him from hitting 30 plus home runs again this year? And I think that changes kind of what this lineup can do because they don't have a whole lot of other power sources. They they got a, a bunch of guys that can get on base and hit for average. In Yoshida, Turner, uh, Devers, uh, Verdugo. So those guys get on base. Well, and I think that's where Tristan Casas is a really important piece of this team because he is that power that they need. Um, The question is, can he unlock that in his rookie season? Totally, yeah. I think he's a huge key to the lineup. So Um, my question is, so this is a team that, I thought Adalberto Mondesi was going to be their shortstop. Apparently, he's, he's already on the 60-day. Yeah. Was he injured when they got him? Yes, he was. He tore his ACL last year. Okay, so when's he expected to be back? I don't know. I, I was kind of surprised. I thought he would be back like sooner because he tore his ACL last April. So I thought he'd be back by now, but I guess maybe it's going slow. Yeah, but because... I was just thinking about that, and like even once you get him, I mean, you move Kike to second, Mondesi at short, but that I don't really think that improves your lineup all that much. No, that's not for the lineup at all. I think that's more that would help the defense. Yeah, that's true. No. And that was what we talked about in our preview of the Red Sox, where we were kind of ripping them for their up the middle alignment with Duvall playing center. Kike playing shortstop, kind of having guys out of position. And, and that could still be a serious issue for them going yeah. forward. But 
See, they do have Rymel Tapia that they could throw out there in center if they really need defense, though. I don't really think he's a great center field defender either. All right, Rob Ref Snyder. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, moving moving along here to the average category, where Adam Duvall is hitting 588, but another guy who who's hitting 588 is Dansby Swanson, who had. Um, 10 hits in his first four games with the Cubs. So you can't really think of a better way to start, you know, your seven year contract with the Cubs. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it. Um, Out of his 10 hits, eight of them are singles. I think Cubs fans are probably really hoping that over time, more of those turn into doubles because Dansby's not slow by any chance or by any means. He's not fast, but he's not slow. Yeah, like, he's been hitting the ball very hard all around the field. I think the doubles and the home runs are easily going to be coming. Um, I think he looks, obviously this is like very, you know, anecdotal, but he looks very comfortable. And a lot of players have kind of an adjustment period, especially when they sign like giant contracts. Seems like he's avoided that at least initially. Um what yeah. do you think about like big big money contract guys in their first season, first month of the first season? So as we've talked about here, especially last year and the year before that, kind of with uh, Goldie and Notto and how that's kind of gone, like it always seems like a, a pl- like especially a superstar's first season with a new team, you really like expect them to be like continue their elite production, whatever. And then if they take a down year, a lot of people say, Oh, they're washed, but it's like, no, that's a big adjustment. So the fact that he is coming in and right off the bat, he's got 10 hits and 18 plate appearances. And he like, just looks comfortable and happy. I think that is huge. Like uh, this is kind of even more anecdotal than just saying he looks comfortable, but there's uh, people that I've seen that are not Cubs fans that are just on Twitter going, much as I hate to say it, Dansby Swanson looks like a Cub. Like, I, I realize that's kind of a weird thing to say, because, like, what does that actually mean? But, like, he looks comfortable being in the lineup. Um, he looks like he's happy being there. Like, he likes being there with the fans, and he's playing well. So... Like everything seems to be coming together where it's just like, yeah, you'd think he's been there for a long time. He's playing well. He's there with the fans like they like him. He likes them, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that just kind of goes to show the confidence that he's showing right now, especially at the plate. So seeing his results be mostly singles right now, he does also have a walk like at some point you're you're definitely going to see those start translating into more doubles maybe a triple some home runs but i mean hey if you get eight or yeah if you get eight singles in the first week of of the season it's a pretty good streak so yeah and the defense has been phenomenal to start the year too that up the middle defense for the cubs is looking excellent with horner and swanson um at one point in the weekend, after the Cubs had faced uh, Brandon Woodruff and Corbin Burns in the first two games, basically Ian Happ and uh, Dansby Swanson had almost all the hits that the Cubs had had the entire season. The rest of the team had two hits combined in like 47 plate appearances or something. That sounds like the Cubs I was expecting this <laughs> yeah. year. Yeah, they have a very they have like a couple good players. The rest are very uh, hit or miss. So, uh, just kind of talking about the average leaderboard in general right now, there is a couple things here that I'm noticing that they make a lot of sense. So, obviously, it, I think Luis Arise is up there, right? Yep, that's actually exactly what I was about to say. Wander Franco, who as a prospect had an elite hit tool. And Luis Arise are both hitting uh, about 524 for Arise, 533 for Wander through uh, about 17 to 22 plate appearances for the two of them, um, which obviously incredibly low sample size. They're definitely not going to be hitting over 500 um, much past about the middle of next week, probably. 
Um, but but still, but, like that's, a, that's like, those, important because those are the guys that are going to end up at the top of the leaderboard yes. by the end of the season. That's last year's batting champion and a prospect who that's what he was known for. Like then last the t- year, he showed that he had an, an elite hit tool and he basically never struck out. The only guy yes. who struck out less than him was Arise, I think. Yeah, and so seeing these two guys up here, it, like it's not shocking, but it does make you feel a little bit more comfortable that like, okay, things are going a little bit how we expect. Cause it's not, everything is an all topsy turvy where you've got Joey Gallo. Who's got a 588 batting average and, and all this stuff. Like the <laughs> Joey Gallo is hitting over 300, which is basically like a 500 average for him. True. But I think we're, we're getting to the, I don't want to say we're getting to the point cause we're definitely way too early for that point. Um, as we go through, we're going to start to see the um, leaderboards normalize. After about 30 games, I think, is probably where we can start going, okay, yeah, this is an uh, inappropriate sample size for a lot of these players, and kind of talk about it that way. But we are seeing trends that are going towards the normalization. So we can yeah, we could say pretty much whatever we want but the real answers are also here pretty close to the top. So. Yeah, that's super interesting that just in 4 or 5 games you already see the guys you expect to be at the top be at the top and that's it's just a you know just shows how good those guys are. Yeah. Yeah, and then you've also got some guys in here that don't really make a whole lot of sense. Yoan Mankata, um Nolan Gorman, Alec Bohm, they're in the top 15 and those are guys that they're really probably going to be more power than average ultimately at the I end think, of the year. I think Bohm Bohm could hit for a good average. You think so? Yeah. Gorman, I don't think he's going to hit for a great average. He's definitely a Joey Gallo type with a better average than Gallo, I think, but yeah, he, he's definitely not a, Oh, what is it? 500 hitter like he's showing right now. So yeah. Um, Another interesting one, a lot of people are talking about this, the stolen bases. We've seen success rates go way up from the beginning of the season last year. It was around 67% through the first four days of the season. Now we're at 80% with roughly double the number of attempts Mm -hmm. as last year. So lots of people are running, trying to take advantage of these new rules. Uh, We see Jorge Mateo and Cedric Mullins both with four steals each. Um, Miles Straw also has four steals. So these fast guys are the first guys that are kind of giving it a shot. I think we might even see some of these less fast guys start taking off from here. Um, What do you think about that? Yeah, so this one's really, really interesting to me, especially because there's a few different rules that were uh, implemented this year to kind of address this. Because as you mentioned, in 2022 through the first four games, um, we saw 29 steals in 43 attempts for a 67% success rate this year through four games, which is through y- yesterday. Yeah. Through yesterday. Through Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yes. Cause this was before games started yesterday is when Passon tweeted this. So through Sunday, um, we had 70 steals. So more than twice as many steals on 84, um, uh, attempts, which is less than double. So that takes the success rate up to 83.3%. I think you said as of this morning it was actually 84 steals on a hundred attempts. So yes. we are seeing a lot more steals a lot sooner. And which with the bigger bases, with the uh, pickoff attempt limitations, with like the shift being limited, which it doesn't really affect too much of coverage on pickoffs and, and, throwing out runners necessarily. Um, But like there's a lot of these little rule changes that I think are adding up to people trying it more. And so far we're seeing a lot of early success. Um, And like you said, it's out of the big guys that we expect your Mullins, your Jorge Mateos. I think you're going to start to see your kind of second level of speed threats come in and try it. So you're going to see more Tommy Edmond. You're going to see more Bobby Witt Jr. You're going to see more guys like this. Those As, guys aren't really second tier, though, well, right? Those guys are like prolific base dealers that's already. That's fair. Okay, so uh, who would uh, who's who's the second tier guy that 
Uh, Christian Yelich? I'm I'm thinking like the guys that steal like roughly like ten bases a year. So I'm thinking like a guy like Ian Happ would be okay. like a guy that could take so, advantage of these rules. Yeah. So if the success rate for the fast guys is going up on a, hot, a lot higher number of attempts, like we're going to start seeing your Ian Happ probably go. Okay, so my chances are probably higher too. And if he was confident in himself to steal ten bases last year, well, he maybe, yeah. maybe he's going to steal fifteen or twenty um, if he starts soon. So we'll start to see that happen. And as that happens, you're probably going to see success rate drop a little bit. Wouldn't be shocked to see that normalize out. But I mean, if it is seventy five percent this year for success rate, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, um, there's one specific pitcher that's already had a major problem with base stealers. That's Noah Syndergaard. He's like the worst in the league at giving up stolen bases. And he pitched the other day, like Saturday or Sunday, I think. And Corbin Carroll is on first base. Corbin Carroll might be the fastest guy in the league right now. Mm -hmm. He took second and he took third and there were not throws on either of those stolen base attempts. Um, so Noah Syndergaard is going to need to figure something out because he's going to get taken advantage of all year if he doesn't do something. And and that kind of leads into what I want to ask you, like how do catchers and pitchers counteract this? Cause inevitably they will. I don't think we're going to see an 83% success rate continue all year. I think it's going to drop down a little bit, but how? That, so that's a good good question. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more game planning around pickoff attempts to try and try and discourage people from from stealing. Um, so they're going to be a little bit more instead of just looking over and going, that guy's kind of far off. I'm going to pick off. I think it's going to be a bit more. When does this guy like to steal? OK, let's try and pick off here and actually use that as a competitive advantage as opposed to just what I think they've been doing for the most part, which is just throwing over to make sure or to get a guy back. If they think he's straying too far from the base. I mean, I think there was more to it than that in the past, but that's probably the simple way to describe it. Um, the other thing is I kind of wonder if catchers are going to start changing their stance to increase their pop time or to decrease their pop time. Yeah. We've seen that kind of recently in the, like where they, Basically, they don't care as much about the blocking aspect and the, you know, catching the ball aspect. It's like sitting in a position where they can get ready to throw as quick as possible. But that could that could be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because like you see a lot of guys who they're like basically down on one knee with their other leg kind of out far so they could drop to block pretty quickly. I think you might see some of that disappear. So they're in a bit more of a ready position. So, which is really going to hurt some of these guys who have terrible blocking skills and, but great arms, because you're probably going to see more pass balls. You're going to see more wild pitches yeah. if they change the, their stance. The pickoff thing is so interesting because the pitchers almost don't want to do the second pickoff because then the runner has such a high incentive to run because they know that the pitcher is not really going to want to go over the third time because they could get called for this, this balk. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I think I asked you this, like before the season started about if anyone was going to steal like 50 bases or like 60 bases or something, does this first week give you any hope of that happening or not really? Cause, cause mm -hmm. Really, people are are making it like a big deal, but the the number of ten attempts is not like a crazy increase from from last year. It's like one point three attempts per game, like for both teams in a game, uh, to one point six through the first like four games of the season. So, I mean, it's yes, not but like that's also drastic. that's also averaged across all players. So uh, your attempts your attempts are up significantly for certain types of guys, I think. And so I think the chances of us getting from a 41 steal John birdie in 2022 to say a 50 steal Cedric Mullins in 2023, I don't think that's that crazy. I think what we're yeah. seeing right now is kind of showing that that very well could happen. 
I the the commercial that you and I watched that was kind of explaining the rule changes and it was uh, Vogie. Is he going to try and steal? That's not going to happen. You're not going <laughs> to see Daniel Vogelbach go out here and steal 50 bases. You shouldn't expect him to steal five. So. But I, I do think that you'll see a guy get 45, 50 steals. And I think that it's it's obviously going to have to be one of these guys who has everyday play time and already stole a lot. So it's going to be a Trey Turner. It's going to be a Cedric Mullins. It's going to be somebody like that. I don't think Mateo is going to be a full year guy. I don't think John Birdie is going to be a full year. Mateo guy. could do it if he got that. on base, if he got on base and was actually like a semi, you know, competent hitter. He's just so bad. Well, yeah. And that's my point. Yeah. So, I mean, we could see Mookie Betts go for a 30, 30 season this year. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So, um, I, I got one more on the on the hitter side that we go over to pitchers real quick, but Miguel Vargas leads the league in walks. Okay, we got but nine so far. Can I ask you a question about that? Is he actually swinging the bat yet? Yeah, it's funny because in spring training he had a little hand injury, and his manager told him not to swing the bat, but just go up there see see the live pitching, and he took multiple walks in spring training without even having any intention of swinging the bat. So. Hopefully it doesn't turn into a situation where he's just become so passive that all he can do is stand up at the plate and not swing the bat. But to me, it shows this guy's very uh, patient and he, he's not like a lot of other rookies who are, you know, trying to impress people, trying to swing the bat and make things happen. This guy's like content to accept his walks and, yeah, he, he's not, he's not pulling a Jordan Walker right now who has really not Has's been patient one. at all. Yeah. Um, uh, Jordan Walker's got incredibly lucky so far that he's got what five hits and, and he's hit the ball really hard when he does make contact. So like he's getting lucky there, but yeah, it, it, patience is something that is key is a rookie. Like you don't want to be Nolan Gorman last year. You don't want to be, um, Oh, who's another one of these rookies that just went out and swung and missed a ton. Jared Kelnick. Yeah. You don't want to be Jared Kelnick. Um. So. Yep. Okay. So I got got a few pitcher stats here. I was going to say also the other thing. Gunner's up that list too. He's at six walks. Yeah, and he's so. a he's always been a big uh, walker in the minor leagues and everything. That's also super impressive. He's one of the youngest players in the American League. He's twenty one years old and showing discipline like a ten year vet. So pitchers, though, what do we got? Pitchers. So atop the whip leaderboard is Jeffrey Springs, and it's pretty obvious the reason why, because he went out and pitched six no-hit innings against the Tigers on Saturday or Sunday. Um, Sunday. And he had a walk in there. Uh, Luis Castillo, honorable mention, also has a .17 whip tied with Springs. This raised pitching staff, looked phenomenal i i realized they were playing the tigers so let's not like get ahead of ourselves but with mcclanahan um jeffrey springs drew Zach rasmussen Eflin, drew rasmussen all those all these guys have pitched and just absolutely dominated um and a guy like springs is the most amazing example i think of of those four because he was a reliever for like four years in the major leagues and he was not even like a super well-known reliever and then the rays were like hey we'll make you a starter and now he's maybe a top 20 pitcher in the league and and the, he's probably the most underrated pitcher in the league right now people just don't know anything about jeffrey springs but he dominated all season long and he just followed it up with an amazing start to start this campaign hey but yeah, um, the uh, the whip leaderboard though, like, kind of surprised to see is mate. So I think I might have it on all pitchers and not just starters. Hold on, yeah, because I don't think Mason Thompson is a starter, is he? I don't even know who that is. Yeah, so he's uh, no, he is not. 
he is a reliever on the Nationals. Because I was going to say, there's no way he's top five. Um, but yeah, Dylan Cease with that absolutely dominant performance. Um, Drew Rasmussen, Dustin May is pretty far up the list. Like a lot of guys you're going to expect here. Um, you've got some guys who've done some pretty good stuff in their first appearance, and we'll see how that goes. Like Johnny Brito for the Yankees. No idea who he is. I assume he's a rookie. He's a rookie, and he's kind of thrown into the starting role because they've got several injuries in that rotation right now. And he had a great start to start his career, I guess. Herman Marquez is not a sub one whip guy. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, I think it's a, this one I probably shouldn't have picked out. I just wanted to talk about Jeffrey Springs. I mean, it's basically based off one start. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. So another one based off one start is strikeouts. And I was impressed to see that Logan Webb struck out 12 guys against the Yankees in his first start. Um, that was cool because Logan Webb, while he is a very good pitcher, strikeouts not like a huge part of his game. Uh, he only struck out uh, 20, where is that? 20, yeah, 20.7% last year. And then he comes out and, and does 12 strikeouts this year. So well, has he turned over a new leaf? It's probably too too soon to tell, but some, something I'm keeping an eye on here. Well, and that, that game itself was pretty interesting because that was Garrett Cole versus Logan Webb, and both starters had over 10 Ks on opening day. I think it was like the third or fourth time that's ever happened. So, oh, uh, Jeffrey Springs also had 12 strikeouts. So, <laughs> another mention of him. And then Otani with the uh, casual 10, Dylan Cease with the casual 10. Yes. Strikeouts are actually up this year from last year, just slightly. So Nick Lodolo with nine. That's something you like to see. Oh, yeah. So I'm uh, hoping that he keeps his uh, homers per nine down this year. So I think that's going to be the killer for him. 100% agree. Yeah. And then the last one, innings pitched. Four, uh, five guys have had seven inning starts this year. The five guys, Aaron Savali, Graham Ashcraft, Dustin May, Seth Lugo, and Nick Martinez. Those last two are like the really surprising ones because those are the four and five starters for the Padres. So if your your four and five starters are giving seven inning performances, I mean, that rotation is phenomenal. Yeah, well, and then uh, today, the first game through the second time through the rotation for some of these teams, Sandy Alcantara, I think, just won a complete game, didn't he? I didn't check, but he was pitching in the eighth. Yeah, so Let's see, yeah, they. Fi- I mean, they finished the game one nothing, and he pitched. Uh, Chat yep, saying complete game it shutout. Off. So complete game shutout. Yep. Yeah. So Sandy is already pretty far up the list. So, although I'm not seeing him, was because he, he only st- pitched like four innings in his first start. Oh, did he? Yeah. Uh, oh, 5.2 five, 5. in his 5. first start. 2. So, but yeah, I fully expect to see Sandy uh, lead the majors in innings pitched again this year. Yeah, so. it's, it's going to be him or Garrett Cole, most likely. But yeah, I think overall, looking at the um, just the leaderboards for the first time through the rotation, really. We're not seeing anything crazy, which I think is interesting. Like the good pitchers are good. The bad pitchers are bad. I like I'm curious based on that game. um, That opening day game in St. Louis, I'm curious to see just how far down the list. A uh, guy like. What's his name? Alec Manoa and uh, Miles Michaelis are because they were they were getting knocked around pretty good. 
So let's see. <laughs> Jack Flaherty is at a 1.4 after his seven walk game. Wait, what? What? Uh, what stat is that? Uh, whip. Oh, whip. Yeah. Jack yeah, Flaherty walked seven batters and did not give up a run. That and was the, one of the worst no hit like performances I think I've ever seen. Yeah. And then <laughs> Jordan Hicks came in and walked three more to load the bases. Yeah. And then the Cardinals managed to win that game. Like, I do not understand that at all. I think the Cardinals are going to have a lot of uh, nine to eight games this season. Yes, they are. It's going to be miserable for me because I like pitching. <laughs> this is not the year for pitching. I think that might be one of the, the takeaways from this year. Like, there's been a bunch of home runs this year, even in the early going. I don't know if that's weather related. Walk rates are up. Um, who knows what's going on at the ball? Like, that, I, I don't think this is going to be anything like 2021 year of the pitcher. Yeah, no. This I think this is feeling back with, and then in in addition with all the rules changes, all the rules changes favor offense. So that's that's what we're going to see this year. Yeah. So uh, going back to that whole first four days of the season stats that uh, Jeff Passan had posted here on April third through four game or four days of twenty twenty two, the average or like the the triple slash for the league was 230 batting average, 308 on base, 374 slug. Through 2023's first four days, we were already at 245, 323, and 292. So we're at 15 points higher on average in OBP and 20 points higher on slug. And uh, 392, right, I assume. What did I say? You said 292. Oh, yeah, 392. My bad. Um... We're about 20 points higher on slug and it's the cold part of the year. So that that slug is just going to keep going up as we get into the dog days of summer here. If the average stays about 15 points higher, you're naturally going to see your slug percentage go up. You're naturally going to see your OBP go up. This is going to be a huge offensive year. So I don't know if it's necessarily going to be record setting home run totals per team like we saw back in 2019. Something tells me, no, we're not going to get that far. But yeah. I don't think that we're only going to have three 40 home run guys this year. I think we're going to see some guys that are hitting about 325 by the end of the season, if not a little bit higher. Like, I think the, the leaders in the triple crown um, categories are going to have crazy numbers, I think is is what I'm gonna willing to say right now. Yeah, I'm I'm on board. I know you said you like pitching. I like pitching too, but it it's gonna make the the seven inning shutouts, the you know, the complete game shutouts that we saw from Sandy today, it's gonna make those even more special, I think. I'm yeah. good with offense being up. That's more exciting to me. Fair, but I do like the days of seeing guys go nine innings once every oh, yeah. week or two. Like, For sure. Just change it up. Like, if we had a game, if we were able to mix it up where it's like once a week we're going to see someone go nine innings, another day of the week we're going to see like 19 runs scored, I'm all in. I want craziness. I don't necessarily want to see the same game every day. No. So. For sure. Yep. So we'll be definitely keeping an an eye on all these rule changes. I mean, it's been four or five games for these teams. There's so much more we're gonna get out of a full season. Actually, it's gonna take probably several years to like understand really the effects of all these rules. Plus, with them all happening at, at the same time, it makes it all the more challenging. But we'll try to and will keep, all these keep locked in on that yeah. will all these rules still exist in seven years probably not we change stuff every <laughs> year just because we can yeah but who knows um yeah so thank you so much for joining us and we'll be back with you next week if you enjoy the podcast please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app or youtube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes join the conversation on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok at getaway day pod if you enjoy card collecting, check out our sister YouTube channel at Getaway Day Cards.